You're listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club Podcast, an audio book club. Thanks for checking out today's episode of Graphic Novel Explorers Club. I'm one of your hosts, Johnny Flores. I am joined by... Francis Preziosi. <laughs> and... Dennis Supachana. Today we are discussing March by John Lewis, and Andrew Aiden, and Nate Powell. We hope you have already read today's title because all three of us have read the book and we'll be discussing it, so beware spoilers ahead we would love for you to share your opinion and thoughts on our social media our twitter handle is at gn explorers club we're also on facebook or you can email us at gn explorers club at gmail.com graphic novel explorers club is available on itunes stitcher and wherever podcasts are available all right uh we're back with another episode of graphic novel explorers club and today we're covering march Book one, which uh, is attributed to John Lewis, I should say Congressman John Lewis, Congressperson John Lewis, uh, Andrew Aiden, and Nate Powell. Uh, and this book came out in 2013, 2013, if I can say the word. Um, and it's about John's childhood and what pushed him into uh, the civil rights movement. And then I'm assuming eventually in books two and three, you find out like why he started running for office and, um, whatnot. right. So it's a true story. We should say that. Oh yeah. I guess I should say it's a true story <laughs> about the civil rights movement. Um, there's so, three books. There's three, yes. books, oh, okay. three volumes. Do you not want to read the other two? <laughs> no, I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into uh, it. Yeah. Um, uh, racist. Um, <laughs> no, no. I will say Francis is not. She's racist. apologetic. Racist. No, no. no, she's not. I'm not racist. Host. Thank you. <laughs> she's not racist. <laughs> but I am one of the hosts of Graphic Novel Explorers Club, joined by Johnny and Dennis. Yes. We forgot to introduce ourselves. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, and in the background, <laughs> you're going to hear a space here going on because we're recording this in a very cold garage in the middle of December. Right. It's a basement where you keep us to record. Yes. We've been trying to get out for eons. I desperately <laughs> want to eat, so I will say whatever Johnny well, wants if, <laughs> if this episode goes well enough, you guys will get your gruel. Um, so the book starts off on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which is uh, located in Selma, Alabama. Um, and two characters are asking, can you swim? And both of them say, no, we cannot. And then you see just a large throng of police officers with um, riot gear. Yeah. Riot gear, shotguns, dogs, and they're telling uh, the two gentlemen and the crowd that they're with that this is an unlawful assembly. And um, they ask the John and the other people on the bridge asked to speak to the leader of the police. And they're saying, Nope, it's not going to happen. And then, Chaos ensues. Go ahead. I'll say right. Yeah. So at first I thought this was going to be a book about the movie. Um, I think it's called Selma. Selma. Yeah. yeah. So, but what was very interesting about that very small but pivotal scene, which I never realized because these are adults. I was like, how do adults not know how to swim? And I didn't realize like they're facing even more like the possibility yeah. of death because they can't swim and i was like mm-hmm. what are you doing marching across the bridge <laughs> and you have no out like so i i felt for them even more than i had originally because i didn't i mean it's horrible but even that was like wow yeah you didn't know the peril that they were that's how bad things were that they were willing to take a beating and be bit by dogs and possibly shot and arrested and all this horribleness or drown. Yeah, that, that was it. Yeah. And it, it gets into it later, uh, but I was like, well, why aren't they kind of fighting back or f- being a little more, yeah. um, I don't know, defensive? And I, I was a little confused until I read a little more. Oh, you didn't? Well, I knew it was a passive, peaceful. peaceful movement, but I didn't realize their tactics that they went through. Oh. And then, so we'll get into that later. Yeah, the yeah. training that they get into later, I was not aware of the organ like the uh the organization that went on right with getting everybody on board with the same uh tactics right and it's which not everybody was but right um right. but it was interesting to learn that uh go ahead again i don't know if the three of us are like hey let's go out tonight and go get beat up 
Like, I... Well, it's not even that. It's, like, so much the, uh... I, like, we're lucky, all three of us, that, like, none of us have had that kind of oppression where, like, things are so bad. I'm, I'm willing to take a baton to the head or possibly drown to get my point across. Mm -hmm. That's, um, so then the book, book jumps ahead to, uh, January 20th, 2009, which is president Obama's, uh, inauguration day. I didn't realize that at first. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> no. Oh, I totally got that. No, I, I <laughs> had to kind of check it too. I was like, wait. Because the election was 2008. No, I know, but yeah. I just wasn't. I was like, what the hell's the significance of that day? Well, I wasn't sure if he was going to, if this was like a not true story, like, like he was going to be the president and not Obama. <laughs> well, like, like I meant like, is it like following Obama into presidency? And oh, gotcha. No, like it's gotcha. not. It's, right. Uh, yeah. I thought you meant, it's just I a historic say, day, first black president. Yeah, I thought you meant it was going to be some sort of like alternative history yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where uh S- congressman uh john lewis became president um so it, yeah he it starts off with him getting up um getting ready for his day he's got a missed call um and then he winds up going to his office in washington and he's met uh he's meeting rosa parks there um which i didn't realize that um they went to the to a Obama's uh, inauguration together. You like it, the impact of that, mm-hmm. you know, I knew it was, a, you, you would have to be obtuse not to know the significance of Obama's inauguration and, and, um, uh, election, uh, of, you know, into, in, into the presidency, but just to have like all, all those people that, that's not that I'm for, we're 42. You, Dennis right. and I are 42. Um, Francis is 52. A lady. I'm a lady. I don't see my age. <laughs> she's 52. But she um, looks like she's like 18. <laughs> <laughs> um, like you forget that this all happened in a, within our lifetime. Like right. Basically, sure. you know, not much older than us. You know, like the, uh, the, what this book covers, this march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge is the, what's known as Bloody Sunday which is uh, March 7th, 1965, 10 years before our, you know, the year we were born. Right. And then I, for these people to basically, for for us, it, it's a history book thing, right? It's something we maybe saw on Wonder Years or a movie, but well, yeah, we didn't live through it. Yeah, there was that movie about... Burning Mississippi, that yeah. was one of those. Right. Yeah. A- and absolutely. and But we didn't actually live through this time period. And for these people to actually have lived through that, been a significant members of it and now to see obama rise to the presidency is amazing oh it's been balanced out with i think that's another important thing too though (laughs) it's not just our like our age um we're all from california this didn't happen in california like a lot of the segregation so it's not something that like my family ever really talked about because they didn't you know my mom talked a lot about like the 60s and what happened to her and what it was like but it's because it's not in the South, it's a completely well, different Well, our segregation experience. is different in California. It did happen. The Watts riots were part of – you're an L.A. kid. Yeah, Watts that's riots true. were yeah. were part of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, L.A. PD has been in trouble for decades for their um, – how the, their treatment of black people and minorities. The Zoot Suit riots in the 40s was born mm-hmm. out of racism too and uh, with the Chicanos and um, – here in Sacramento, Oak Park, the freeway split that. Oak Park was one of the most aff- affluential um, communities in Sacramento. It was a black community. And then when freeways came in, they put the freeways right through the – they divided it off from the I rest of it. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it was called redlining. That's what redlining means gotcha. is you, you, uh, you segregate through – political means right. not through well, it, it did happen i'll give you that but not to the point where like oh we can't go to the same restaurant yeah we can't use the same yeah it wasn't uh, as bathroom yeah. yeah but you are you are correct um, a little bit <laughs> <laughs> way to concede <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'll take it finally i'll take it um no so uh so uh the congressman is getting ready to go out to the inauguration this mother and two little boy and her two sons um come into his office and they think they're just gonna get a tour 
just take a peek at they know it's his office they just don't realize he's actually there and then and then he's there and asks can i get you guys something to drink and then the mom realizes like oh my god you're you're uh you're john lewis and um the only thing is i will question this only a little bit because i would think there would be high security in that area and they usually have a handler for tours mm -hmm. so usually someone would escort them into the office so something Johnny and I found out right before we started recording, which I, I was unaware of, this is a YA graphic novel. Right. Yeah. Oh. I, my librarian girlfriend told me that. Yeah. I didn't I, realize. I this. didn't know that because I kind of felt the oh. same thing. But now that I know the age group it was written for, there it's not going to, there's going to be some lightness, I gotcha. think, yeah. to it. Gotcha. Yeah. So the, um, we were talking about this beforehand, how the children are the entry point for, right. for a young reader yeah. into the book. So. Um, and I think it could, too, go back. Um, I haven't read two or three yet, but to, to um, his character and the kind of person he is, that he will embrace you. He will embrace the opportunity. Absolutely. To, and to tell a story. Yeah. yeah. So, well, not a story, but tell the history. Yeah. Well, And that's and it, it jumps into his history right after that. And I was going to – his, his um, protection of innocent comes up almost right away mm -hmm. in, in that. So he starts – the children ask him about his history – and they see all these chickens, chickens like porcelain chickens and little uh, 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 kish, kishki, um, knickknacks, kitschy, kitschy. Kitschy, there kitschy we go. That's the word I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I've had one and a half ciders. I don't want to be racist and correct you. <laughs> I've also had one and a half ciders, but I'm not. No, you haven't. You <laughs> fucking liar. You goddamn liar. See? I've had three glasses of champagne. <laughs> um, and he explains that he grew up in. Um, pike county alabama in a really poor part of the of the community and that his um dad had i believe it was 300 acres of land 110 acres 110. That he bought for 300 dollars. Oh, for 300 dollars, yeah um and um they you know had a they had but several different crops but they also raised chickens for eating um and um uh, for harvesting eggs and he uh john was immediately felt protective of his chickens and named them. He would number the chickens and he would, I guess it's a superstition. You only write odd numbers right. on your, on your eggs to keep track of them. Um, but he, he becomes very protective of his, of his hens and the chickens and, uh, we'll have funerals for him. And, um, they ask him about, you know, why didn't you become the, the, the two children in his office, ask him why didn't you become a chicken farmer and he goes into how he really wanted to become a preacher which we'll, we'll get to in just a bit kind of jumping around here a little bit but uh he he like he anytime that a chicken is going to be killed for dinner he turns his back on his parents is very moody and and argumentative with them and mm -hmm. and hides um and then he'll uh He'll have funerals for the chickens when they, the ones that pass away, they don't make it for the, whatever reason. The hens that don't have eggs to hatch, he'll, he'll take some from the hens that have a lot and we'll give it to the ones that don't. So, Which he learns uh, quickly that uh, if you try to overextend how long the hens sit down for the eggs, it's actually bad for the chickens. Yeah, yeah. they can't that. walk. Right. Yeah. I think some of that wasn't like the moving the eggs, though, was just to like keep egg, keep keep the um uh, keep more chicks alive right oh, okay. yeah i don't know if it was like and also altruistic. i think i think it was also because he wanted odd numbers so if someone had even numbers oh, i think, oh, I think he took, yeah. um but he he like one chicken he tried to baptize and he accidentally drowned it and then it it he put it out in the sun and, and it came back alive but it just shows like he has a an innate um drive to protect innocence mm -hmm. and, and and make sure justice is kind of provided for all mm -hmm. um which i think is the seedling of getting him into the civil rights for sure movement later when he's a teenager actually um so i feel like this is gonna be a really quick episode because there's well yeah i mean it's you can't really it's not like some of our other books where we've 
analyze like the meaning of the author and, and, and such. I mean, this is someone's life, so we can't go, well, I didn't like the way that story <laughs> went. I think he should have done this. Yeah, that was... We're not going to question someone's why life choices. Why did the writer do that? <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't feel this dad's realistic. No, that's... This is what actually happened. Yeah. Um, at one point, I feel like his parents knew he was a little different, and not in a negative way, than the rest of his siblings and that he was very dedicated to school. He seemed to have a, a drive to learn. He wanted to know, have more knowledge than what was just the farm in the community. Right. Well, um, I don't know if you're going to get there, so, but I'll, I'll speak to it now. Um, because they live on a farm during farm season, the dad pulls all the kids out of school mm -hmm. because they need to work the land. Well, he's not having it and he'll hide <laughs> yeah. and um, he will like hide under the house. So his mom and dad can't find him. And when the school bus comes, he makes a run for it and gets on the bus because he begs his dad, like, please let me go to school. Please let me go to school. And he's like, no, like you need to be here. You need to work the farm. Right. And, um, but yeah, he's so dedicated. I mean, I, I think it's the reverse for most kids. They would love to not go to right. school, right? I don't want to go to school. Don't make me go to school. It's like the opposite story of being a delinquent. <laughs> and, 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 and and his dad kind of gives him a firm yelling but never hits him uh, regarding the fact that he basically bailed on the family to go to school. Well, and and he, he says he will. And yeah, he and he always does. tells him, like, this is the last time you're going to do this. But he never does anything about it because I yeah. think he understood that his son was different. And, in, and to speak to that, you know, like you said, Johnny, he would actually bury – the chickens and their own little graves. He started, I think, at this point, preaching to the chickens. Yeah, he yeah. Practicing, could, yeah. Right, because he learned to read from the Bible, which was kind of a common thing back then. And um, so he would give these sermons to these these chickens, and they would nod and and everything like that. The only thing they didn't say was, I think, "Amen." Yeah, no matter how he tried, he wouldn't <laughs> say "Amen." That was his one. Um, so uh, we get to a point in the book where one of his uncles comes down from upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And um, the the family decides that John can go visit the big city, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Like Chicago, right, or something like that. I thought it was Ohio. Like, uh, I thought it was Albany. No, they passed no. the the part about Ohio is um, his his uncle is real tense the entire time they're passing from the south, heading up north until basically they get to around Ohio, right, and then he can see his uncle just uh, vis like he's visibly relaxed. Right, he so this is a 12-hour drive if I remember correctly and it's funny because once again speaking to what you talked about in the beginning, um, it's a different time period. You know, I think about uh, a seven-hour drive that I have to make sometimes uh, to see family and you know, I, I think about, oh god, you know where are we going to eat, etc. and hopefully kids are entertained here. I mean, they have to make sure they pack their lunches because they cannot stop in certain areas because well, it's dangerous. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the bathroom breaks are like so planned out. Right. Like things we take for granted. Right. Like just well, and also he has to think, at what point am I going to get my head caved in right. by some racist fucking cop or am I going to say or do the wrong thing and wind up in jail? And the or, worst thing is because he has northern plates driving through a southern area and being black – those are a lot of bad things. So, yeah, just like Francis said, I mean, they have to plan their bathroom breaks, be not because, oh, I wonder where this is going to be at this point. It's because they have to be in a safe zone where they're, they're like you said, Johnny, not going to get their head caved in, which is amazingly weird to think about, but, I mean, very true to the time. Yeah. Um, and, and he talks about how the, the, the plates, yeah, like you were saying, make them, make them a visible target. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they get to – they go to Buffalo – New York and uh, and he is immediately impressed by just the noise and the lights and everything that's going on in the community. He remarks how black and white people are living side by side as neighbors with no tension really and, and Well he goes to the mall and buys the candy. Yeah, yeah. But that's like a huge thing. Like yeah. he can just walk up and get what he wants. Yeah, and, and the clerk just hands him the candy. White clerk hands this black kid from the South candy and he is completely just amazed by that. Um, so I think that he – oh, and then he talks about how his aunt, they don't raise their own food. They just go to the market and pick out – Buy a chicken. Yeah, you know, what they what they want, and it's plucked and everything's and he, ready. And he said he had no problem eating it. Yeah. Right. Like he, 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 he's like, this chicken was good. He's like, right. I, he didn't see, feel that same connection. <laughs> I think it's important. It's a whole side note, but just today how food is and how people connect to it. For but, sure. No, that's yeah. a, like a farm the fork kind of yeah, that's, thing yeah. going on there. 
That's a whole nother story. It's a whole nother story. So we'll, we'll go back to civil about. rights. <laughs> yeah, can we? Can <laughs> we, Francis? Animal rights. <laughs> we'll go back to civil rights. Um, so he remarks after he, he visits with his, to Buffalo with his uncle that he, after the trip, home never felt the same, and neither did I. Um, and then we get into the school. <laughs> then we get into school about how he would, you know, hide out. And, and But he remarks on the bus he he realized their bus was the the black children's bus was run down. It was probably second or third hand. The uh, roads weren't paved. Yeah, roads weren't paved unless the a white person. There was like routine white traffic, and then they would pave the road. Their school buildings were just like cinder block hovels, basically. All the um, prisoners that they saw as they passed by were all black. Were black. The people in the fields working were all black. I mean, it's it's. It's one of those things when you don't realize it when you're in it, but then you have that outside city experience yeah. and you see the integration and everything like that. And obviously things weren't perfect, but it was a lot better than it was in the South. Well, it, it goes to that, um, like how they, why the elephant, you know, domesticated ele- ele- elephants that were in circuses, why they would never break that rope. Oh, because when because, they were baby elephants yeah. and they used the the, the, the same rope, they couldn't mm-hmm. break it, and so they just assumed as they, they as they aged, they knew that they that was the limit of the rope, so I mm-hmm. can't get free. And it's it's like uh, that applied to human beings. It's mm-hmm. Like, oh, this is the shitty conditions. Well, we can't break out of it. And they discuss that later on how the older black civil rights leaders, right approached the problem much differently than the younger generation that John was part of. Uh, but it's, it's that same, I don't know. That's, that's my analogy on it. It was the same principle of tie them up when they're for sure, you know, it, it never let them experience anything else. And that's what they, they think that's the limit of their you know, world. It's what a human will right. think. That's the, that's the limit of their experience then. And is it at this point or is it before the trip where his parents kind of remind him like, don't bother the white people. Like yeah. I think they can kind of see he, his frustration and yeah. I'm sure they've experienced that themselves, but they also know like what's at stake to express that frustration. Sure. I think they're always kind of like reminding him in the background, like don't, which don't. also comes into play later when he tries to go to college, go, uh, college. To, 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 to stir to things up a little more. Yeah. Which had to be fucking terrifying for his parents. Yeah. Well, we'll we, get there. Yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. That, I think that's a big topic to discuss. Um, so it, 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 it jumps ahead to when he's a teenager and he hears um, they're listening to the radio and he, and it's the first time he recalls hearing Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, name is uh, a sermon that he did that was broadcast uh, in the southern communities down there. Um, then there's <laughs> uh, he talks about an incident in August of this, when he was a teenager, uh, in Money, Mississippi, this this is from the book, the body of a 14-year-old boy named Emmett Till, who was down south visiting relatives. Uh, he was from Chicago. Um, had supposedly, oh, this is so fucked up. Um, as he left a, a, a county store with some friends, he was heard, Emmett, this boy from Chicago, was heard to have said bye baby to a white woman behind the counter and the next day he was found uh, in the Tallahatchie River tied to a tire and it looks like he had been beaten pretty pretty severely prior to that and then you get to um a trial where this man named Moses Wright um had witnessed two white men a black man named Moses Wright had witnessed two white men drowning Emmett um, and they pretty much confessed to being guilty. It's an all-white jury. Um, they, they didn't confess during the jury, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Afterwards, there, they there confessed. were eyewitnesses, yeah. and I think didn't one of the black didn't a black man like testify? Yeah, like, Moses risked Wright. his life, right? Like, yeah. yeah, Moses Wright. Did. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and that pretty much lit the fire in 
in John's well, yeah. belly right there. Yeah, so they they got free. They got free. F- they they walked no no repercussions, and yep. then they were on a radio show and said, "Yeah, we did it." Yeah. And they're like, "Well, we can't do anything because they already had their trial." Yeah, right. So this time period, he's setting up basically. There's a swell of things happening. There's Brown versus the Board of Ed- Education that just happened about segregation in schools. There's this incident, and then they and then Rosa the Parks park. um, not not giving up her seat, and uh, and that. There's little ripples that will cause a wave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then and and then at the same time, uh, on his 16th birthday, John does his first public sermon, and um, and it, he he's nervous, and then he warms up, and then it gets into the newspaper that this young boy just did his, or actually, I guess old. You know, they always say young man. They never say an old boy. This old boy. Uh, <laughs> Gets He's called the, the boy preacher. Yeah, yeah the boy, boy preacher. preacher. Uh, gets uh, featured in the newspaper for doing a sermon and being a, a young young preacher. Then it cuts back to the present, and uh, the two boys are basically, and the mom say, are saying, you know, we'll get out of your hair. We'll, you know, we, we realize you're you're going to the inauguration, same as us, and you probably are more tied up than we are with time, with your time. Uh, but he continues to talk to the boys. He, he explains how he got to call. He, he, right, they wanted to know how he got into college and yeah. what he did after high school and yeah. how he got to college. And he, he tells them he was accepted into college and basically had to work his way through school doing dishes. Well, didn't his mom work like three jobs yes. to get him to school? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, his whole family did like a lot to help him. Yeah. Go, and, and, and he did have to work while he was there. Yeah. He did have like a campus job. It was job. all black college. Yeah. Uh, and as his, as as his education continues, he, he writes letters to Dr. King, and then finally they reach out to Dr. Dr. King's people, reach out to John, and and invite him over to speak and meet with Dr. Martin Luther King, and um, because he wanted to apply to was it Troy State, yeah, which was not an integrated college, I believe, yeah, but the Thirteenth Amendment had. He yeah. could apply for it, but yeah. no one had applied for it before. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, it's it's weird to see how um, in the book th- this this sort of precursor to the civil rights movement mm-hmm. were trying to figure out if they could vet – like they were vetting him. Right. To see – like they were having discussions kind of while he's in the room about him. Right. It's a lawyer, the a lawyer, Martin Luther King Jr. himself, and some other individual. Some other, yeah, leaders in, within their their movement, and uh, they're they're trying to see, are we going to tr- try this with this kid? Well, I think no, I think they're trying to say, is he up for it? Because they tell him like, your your family could be killed, yeah. like or threatened, threatened dead. They're, they could lose their business. No, but like at first they're kind of talking about him a little bit, and then yeah, and then they say, okay. This kid, okay, we we think this kid could be the kid, right? And then and then, yeah, and then they tell him basically like this is all the danger you and your loved ones can face, and then he discusses it with his parents, and his parents are like, no, we're we're not doing this. Which is totally understandable. Yeah, I I mean to set up his family essentially as martyrs be, is a huge sacrifice because he's not old enough, so he can't right. make, do the lawsuit. That's why his parents have to sign right. off. That's right. That's yeah, right. he's yeah. not he's not of age, and yeah, yeah. his parents were like, nope. Yeah. yeah, and and he even says like I didn't agree with this, like, but it was their choice to make, and there's nothing I could do. And he understood it. He understood why. It's that that's one of the things that like carries through this book uh, with his family is just how him and his parents are all very understanding of each other's points of view, mm-hmm. even if they don't like his dad getting so upset, like I need you in the field, right? But I understand like why you need to go to school too. But I understand, I'm really pissed about you going to school, right? Uh, and, and this too, like he understood his parents' point of view on mm-hmm. why this is not good for all of us. Right. Uh, it's scary. I, just to think about this is is frightening. Like it's frightening. No, to absolutely. Like, to take that step where it's not just your name's going to get slandered, but you, your family could just be murdered. Yeah. You could be fine. I mean, maybe you'll be okay, but when you go home, your parents could just be dead. Yeah. Because of your actions. Or they could just firebomb your house while you're sleeping inside of right. it. Um, well, yeah, and just because like he could get into the school, and I, I think this was highlighted when um, the first the first school got um, 
integrated. Oh. It's not a good experience when no. you're the first and you're going right. to you're like alone. People right. don't want you there. It's so even when you win, quote unquote, you it's just the first step of a very large challenge. The only thing I had to worry about with college is my student loan debt, <laughs> right? which is pretty bad. <laughs> well, um, and it, it's amazing to get, I, I always forget, and this is my ignorance. You know, I always tie the, the civil rights movement with the sixties, but the truth is a lot of this started mid fifties. Right. I'm so, the same way. Yeah. So the Montgomery bus uh, protest, that was 1955. Rosa Parks was, I think it was 55, 56. Uh, so, I mean, this is a if, long time. Sorry. No, if, go ahead. If, if my history lesson serve me correctly right now, Rosa Parks actually, like, she was, like, part of the movement. Like, there was a team behind her exactly. that put her on the bus. Yeah, and there was women that were all – there were other um, – There wasn't just women. It was, like, men, too. Like, yeah, they, they, right. they thought, like, she would be the least harmed being a woman, I yeah. think. Like, the, yeah. It, Basically, the same type of tactic they were going to do possibly with um, – uh, John Lewis or Bob Lewis, depending on his young name. He was called it Bob. And yeah, his nickname is Bob because uh, his middle name's Robert. Uh, uh, I think that's the, they were very they were very tactical about it. Yeah, yeah. And so I didn't even know that about Rosa Parks to be perfectly honest, and that was my ignorance. I didn't know she was part of the movement, and this was kind of she wasn't just happened to be. Yeah, there. it wasn't happenstance. That right, but that was good. That, it was smart of them. That is how it was presented to me when I was little right. in grade school. Like, oh, this woman just didn't want to get up one day. Yeah. She was really tired. Right. And you're like, wow. No, yeah. Like, that, she's so brave. And she was. She's still, she's still brave, brave. But you didn't realize what it took just to get one black woman to sit on the bus. But, yeah. And then you look at at, at how they're, they're slowly testing the waters, right? Yeah. Like, they're trying different strategies. Right, exactly. And it's very tactical and it's very smart and it, it's amazing. Well, and you know, and I did wonder that too. I am going too long, but um his parents are really reluctant and I always wondered of the backstory, what did they see? Like what who do they know who kind of tested the water mm-hmm. and the repercussion was just too great? Cuz obviously they, I don't think it was even tested probably for them. It was probably just and then you were dead. Like there was probably right. no well, I'm gonna go see. What, yeah, I'm just gonna step into Woolworths and I'll just right. Mm. I'll just mosey on by the white section of the the dining table. It was like, hey, get the fuck out of here! What the fuck are you doing? Well, and then, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Outside. But their tactics, like I didn't really fully understand. Like they talk about, you know, this is what they did on history books. But when I actually saw how the tactics played out, it was really smart and amazing and admirable. How we we can get into it in a little bit. Yeah. Well, it's it, we're kind of in the section where he's. He's John starting to be integrated more and more into the 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 sort of tactical and thinking side of the civil the leadership side of the civil rights movement, and Dr. King is and the and the group are showing them. He's talking about Gandhi and right. So it's like 1958, and he attends like a non-violence workshop, which correct, is, is, yeah. which is interesting because it also brings up the inspiration for this comic book, graphic novel which is uh, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story, which I was not aware was a thing. And apparently uh, didn't wasn't well-researched for the longest time, but it was actually a comic book printed at the time uh, detailing the history of Martin Luther King Jr. and the Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus mm-hmm. movement and everything like that. And they, they did, did that for the purpose. It was the YA of its time to kind of – not everyone could read very well – and it was to get young people interested in the civil rights movement and communicate that to people who maybe don't read very well. So they actually had created these comic books, and I forgot what company it was uh, that did it initially and printed so many, and they were handing them out to kind of uh, build up uh, the civil rights movement. And it wasn't until like in, even into the 2000s that uh, this was well-researched, that this comic book was printed oh, okay. at the time. Uh, um, but they talk about the evils of racism and it's we haven't really talked about the art of this comic book but well, do you want to finish going through the story sure well they, it's really they show a sequence of what they're how um the evils of what is being forced on the on black americans was the evil of racism and, and they show a noose like a lynch noose poverty the evils of war um, and they show like a man, like a stump, an arm, a, a bloody bandaged arm. Um, and it's interesting to me that Dr. King was already talking about how this affects us as part of the civil rights movement too. Uh, right. 
Uh, anyways, uh, so he he gets more of his friends to attend these workshops, and eventually um, they through start, through like colleges. Right, right, and it's it's fascinating. So this gets into how they kind of train these students to become these protesters. They actually role play essentially racist yeah. versus protesters, and they sit there while people play the role of extreme racist, either yelling the N-word, spitting, spitting on them, them throwing yeah. water, saying the worst things, pushing them, just to build up that tolerance. And not everyone can pass it, but to build up that level where, because they take nonviolence to the extreme. And I've learned about it before, but to actually see how they kind of played it out to the point where they basically psychologically tested themselves. It didn't matter if someone blew smoke in their face, uh, you know, push yelled, them out of the chair. Push them out of the t- chair. Yelled so many profanities directly in their eyes. They were testing themselves so they would not react, which is very different and, how things are now. And some people left. They said, right. "They said like I will support you. I will pass out flowers. Like I can't do this. Yeah. Like I, I'm so angry. Yeah. That um. And I think it's important to note too that there that's also white people that are with these Correct. black college students and they're getting called horrible things too. Just again, to prepare everybody yeah. like this is what's going to happen to you. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. And you're right though. Like they did have to prepare because again, like I don't see the three of us like, Hey, let's go get beat up tonight. Like I'm really <laughs> yeah. upset about like, I, I don't think we could do it. And the, the strength that they had to do this. Yeah. And, is, it, and they had to be prepared to be beat up. It wasn't yeah. just verbal or, yeah. or the spitting. They actually like, how do you protect others who are about to be beaten? What posture do you take as you're being beaten? Yeah. And to not react. I mean, yeah. this was their whole thing. I don't know if we could play out today. I don't know if I would be able to do something like that. If, if no, I had to do a protest. But for them to take that level of uh, peaceful, passiveness, yeah. passiveness, peaceful protest uh, was, I mean, mind blowing. Like you read about it, but this actually seeing in action how they kind of discipline their mind. Yeah. And then when, once it gets into action, we'll get into that a little bit when they start getting into the Woolworth kind of countertop where they're eating and how they do that. Yeah. So they, the, the, the um, college students, this, org- this organized movement, start testing the waters in diners that are going in. And they all sit down. and, and It's supposed uh, to be white only at the counters. Yeah. Yeah, so so at this point, black people are allowed to buy food, but they're not allowed to stay and eat it. They're not allowed to sit at the counter and eat it. There's yeah. it's segregated, and so they all decide to go sit at the counter. Which again, I'm just like, that's so huge for them, and I just sit wherever the heck I want. Like I don't think twice about. And they're where very I sit. systematic too in terms of at first when they're testing the waters, they just sit at the counter and ask to be served. Then they're refused. Then, then they, they go, ask oh, to talk to the manager. The manager's like, we can't serve you. Thanks, and they leave. They leave, and so they're just testing the waters in these different places. And they only have one person each time as the speaker, There's which I thought one was very representative. Yeah. So they're not all shouting. It's all part of their tactic, their peaceful protest, protest, so they don't sound like a mob. Yeah. So it's just one person every time. Yeah, it's interesting tactics that they are, that they're uh, and uh, and effective tactics too. Uh, like I said, I, w- I don't know if this would play out or it should play out this way in modern society, but for this time period where where things are so volatile to try to maintain that discipline is just, yeah, I, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, I'd be, people would be Facebooking it now. Like, can you believe the so and so don't like, yeah. Uh, so then, yeah. So then they start moving into Woolworths and WT grants, which seem to have more severe, um, well, rules about serving black people and where yeah. they can be at. Mm-hmm. And they get, they, it seems to escalate. And aren't more people coming with them now? Like, there's like lines. Yeah. Out, like, there's more black people coming there's in more, in general. So they're yeah. doing this peaceful yeah. protest, I think, where um, someone is. They're going up to the counter. Can you serve me? Can I see your manager? Sorry, we don't serve uh, black people. They leave. Then they have another set ready to go and sit with them, yeah. whites and blacks. So it's basically they they each keep marching in um, peacefully and replacing the the people who were. Well, then what starts happen. to happen is though that the diners just turn off the lights and everyone leaves. Leaves, right? And then they, and then the protesters, or the civil right movement protesters, stay there. And then what starts to eventually happen is the police start showing up, or thugs, or thugs, and they start getting beaten up and hauled out of there. And uh, and then they, they all sing, "We shall overcome someday." Well, well they, they say too though, like so as the 
as there's more black people coming in, they, they do start taking hit and get beat up. But because they're not fighting back, it dies out very quickly. Yeah. And in, in some cases, like I said before, their tactic, which I don't, I don't even know how you can maintain this discipline, you don't necessarily fight the people beating the other people. You basically replace their seat. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Because there was one, like, they went up to the top level. Right. And then this other group of people went to the bottom level. Then the top level went down to go fill in and yeah. it wants to help because they were getting beat up right. so they yeah so th- each That's time right. they were just basically sitting there peacefully protesting even if people were dragging them out and replacing the previous seat so that each time and they would eventually get arrested and then yeah they would all be dragged into jail and they were they're, they're singing um church songs and they're joyful because they they accomplished what they wanted to do they they made a symbolic protest without instigating anything everyone else was yelling at them or beating them, but they were the ones who rose above it. And uh, at first, they there was uh, like I forgot how much the bail was going to be, and then eventually they got reduced and reduced. Yeah, it was like fifty, and then down to five. And it was like no, and we're not leaving. And eventually, they just kind of left well, them. Yeah, because well, they kept singing their hymns and right. in in the in the jail, mm-hmm. they weren't allowing themselves to be oppressed by the by the system. Right, and I think mm-hmm. they said like we're not going to pay to be released from a system yeah. that right. already like you know that we're that yeah. is already oppressing us and they they had to get rid of them like hey you're just leaving yeah. you all out. <laughs> and this was the most this I mean there's parts of this book that are very disturbing but the judicial part of mm-hmm. this oppression when they all go to court when they all go they, they wanted the the judge the the court wanted to try them in mass. Mm-hmm. And then they had a uh, a lawyer who came up and represented them uh, pro bono was like, no, these are individuals and you have to try them individually. And the judge wouldn't even turn around and acknowledge nope. th- the defendants. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot about that part. Yeah. yeah. And it was, uh, I don't know. We could get into a whole, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> the modern day version of this and like MAGA and all the mm-hmm. Trump supporters and, uh, well, I, I'm going to touch on something at the end of this, but you're kind of going there. Yeah, I know. I, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I should stay on topic with the book. Yeah. Um, it's not a short episode. <laughs> <laughs> I guess not. I guess yeah. not. So, yeah. So as the protests continue. Um, well, you start to see how these other movements start happening too, like the N- NAACP. And then there's a different NAACP. Right. There's all, and then there's a lot of civil rights organizations, and then that come out of this, and right. it's and it's a lot of young, educated black people that are that are driving this, and and as we were discussing earlier, some of the older leaders of the black community are like, hey, we've 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 gotten some of these victories. The mayor of this one community has conceded that we can we can sit at the counters with everybody else. Well, didn't like, they do a protest too? Um, like. They decided like not to go eat at these establishments. So like, there was something they stopped um, patronizing patroni- patroning some organization. And they, mm-hmm. the, oh, the buses! It was the buses. Yeah. They stopped riding the buses. And then it right. started affecting the businesses downtown. And this mayor, Mayor West, was a progressive white mayor, but for still the time. not for progressive for the time. Yeah, but he yeah. still wouldn't say you know black people have the right to sit at mm-hmm. the counters with us. He finally concedes that, but. Uh, the the older uh, community leaders in the black in the black community are like okay that's good enough like that's we, we've 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 made a small victory here mm-hmm. and the younger kids are like nope yeah. we, we demand equal rights it is an amendment and we will get them and these aren't just you know some crotchety no no nothing uh, older generation. I mean, one of them was Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall. Yeah. So, but he's of a different generation yeah. and not as radical. And, um, and yeah. He, and another long uh, time representative that he talks about in this is Strom Thurmond, mm-hmm. a racist piece of shit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and. That's not a peaceful <laughs> protest, Johnny. <laughs> I would not make it into the. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't. Yeah, I would. Um, well, it's something as the movement grew too, because they uh, John had to like kind of create like a cheat sheet of how to behave and how to react and not react because um, they just couldn't train everybody the way that they had been trained yeah, because right. it was happening so quickly and, and gaining was, yeah. so much momentum. Yeah, it was growing so quickly. Um, and the book, I didn't. It, I it was 
It said book one. Do we say one. what it stops with? Yeah, yeah. So it 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 concedes. It stops with the the mayor, um, saying that the counters can be integrated. Yeah, and he and they get it on video, and they're and, and or I shouldn't say video. They have video back then, <laughs> but they get it on record on their phones. They, on no. their, <laughs> 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 Cell phones were so big back then. Yeah. Uh, and it and it ends somewhat ab- abruptly with that happening, and then you show it shows the white community and the black community as this concession is, is being granted over the radio and like how just how far reaching it was and how different it impacted depending on your color, how it impacted you. And I didn't realize uh, this book one when I think we were talking about this beforehand, Mm -hmm. how um, it's just as the beginning of this. I I didn't realize I thought it was going to cover more of the actual march across. Right. And we don't even get there. Yeah. Just that, that quick little thing at the beginning of like, Oh, we are either going to get arrested. We're going to get beat up or we're going to drown. Right. So basically it ends with the concession that the counters can be integrated, but it ends with, uh, some individuals, black individuals going to a diner and the white owners and workers basically giving them the stink eye and, and pretty much preventing them. To get in, so basically, there's work, more work to be done. Correct. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's get into some of the art because we didn't really cover that. Well, it's all black and white. I thought it was really good. Um, I don't know. I I just thought it was it was a good use of of uh, the space. Yeah. I thought, especially the chicken part, um, which I loved for some reason. I think as as a little girl. My aunt lived next to like a cow farm and there's this one cow that would always come when I came to visit between the fence and like lick my hand. <laughs> and I, I think like most kids do have a special connection with animals. But um, I thought the artwork was so good because his facial expressions, like mm-hmm. you can see the anger, you can see yeah. the compassion, you just. Or the hurt. Yeah. Like you just feel with him. And I think that like just the expression alone, um, because I think you could say it's almost simplified artwork. It's a little bit on the simple side, but it's very impactful very effective i felt well yeah and especially during some tense moments i don't know if it's a combination of shadow or like even like small beads of sweat being drawn but you can feel the heat and tension of the moment combined with maybe the words um of you know just how i don't tense the moment may have been at that time and yeah seeing some of the stuff where the angry crowds are ripping the the protesters away from their seats and, and and such even though it's not video it's very powerful yeah one of the, my favorite illustrations in this and i'm not um i'm not a religious person but i love the way it shows how the the word of god in the bible impacts him is he's uh he's reading it, it says behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world and it's it's he's basically a silhouette holding a book and it the letters are filling him oh, up. Oh, right. right. I just I like, like how that, that just, it, it shows how the words of the Bible uh, impact him. And how they're accurate? For fiction, yes. <laughs> this is a fiction, remember? This cool story. No, but the Bible's fiction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. So, <laughs> I... I naively thought going into this book, it's just about the march. And when it first opened up, I was like, God, I was like, I don't want to just see a bunch of black people get beat up. Like, I'm not trying to dismiss what they did. Like, I, I really was sure. just like to get into the mind frame to be ready for these. Even like with our more uh, graphic novels that we do with the blood and guts. I, oh, I just well, like, I don't want to. Do this that. is more painful because this shit really fucking happens. Well, it right. continues well, to happen. So then. So then I was pleasantly surprised because it wasn't a bunch of black people getting beat up. It's the story of this little boy and like how he's starting to see injustice and how he's starting to grow up. And, and then like you get to the end and you're like, Oh my God, like the March is going to happen still. Like, so like they're going to get beat up and I don't want them to get beat up. Yeah. Like, and, but I do want to keep reading. Whereas before I was like, I just, I don't really want to read this. I don't want to, I don't want to like painful. see it again. And I, I think that's also really important too. Anytime we talk about, these traumatic events, whether it's like the Holocaust, the Civil War, um, even like now things that are going on, everybody has an individual unique story. You, every time I hear the story, it's from a, it's new. Like like I I didn't realize the training they went to for this. And yeah, yeah, and I definitely have. Um, yeah, I was, I was just shocked and awed, even more impressed of what 
they have accomplished. Absolutely. And I felt the medium was very effective. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not a huge regular book reader just because I fall asleep when reading books. And, <laughs> and I've, I've read the, the uh, civil rights movement before, and it doesn't do it justice. You know, you could read, oh, in 1955 to 56, they had the Montgomery bus uh, protest, and this is what they did. <laughs> to actually yeah. see kind of the tactics, and, and like Francis said, you know, when they're going through their basically boot camp of how to be a pacifist protester is very eye-opening. And then um, one of the lines I thought was interesting, I pulled out that seems kind of funny, uh, given today's news is uh, um, after one of the protests later in the book this is I think after um, the diner protest the governor of Tennessee Buford Ellington said and I, I'm pretty sure this is probably a an actual quote these sit-ins are instigated by and staged for the convenience of the Columbia broadcast system which is CBS so fake news. basically <laughs> the governor was instigating that this was fake and fake news yeah and uh i don't know those kind of echoes are chilling to me uh when we realize that this happened what 50 years ago um uh, more and and or more and that that kind of mentality and that kind of excuse that this isn't real and that it's only being manufactured by the media uh it's, has come into the mainstream again. Right. It, it's disturbing to me. Well, there's something I want to hit on, too, but I want to hear what Johnny's thoughts were on the book. On the book? Um, I... Uh, you can say you hate This it. book is... <laughs> it's uh, same same thing that you felt, Francis. It's, it's painful. It's a painful fucking book to read. Um, it saddens me that this shit has somehow come into acceptance again and um that you can I, an argument could be made that trump's election to president is the answer to or the antithesis to obama being elected um people seem to be so upset that a black man was elected president um and there was so so much uh hatred and um uh, you know just so much um resistance to anything he did continuing now that he's out a, a dismantling of the work that he did solely because he's a black man not because he's i mean somewhat because he's a democrat democratic president but um but because he's a black man and i remember my mom and i my mom's a republican and we were having this discussion before the 2008 election. And I said, I don't think Obama can win because he's black. And there's huge swaths of our country that will not get behind a black man in that, in, as a leader of our country. Uh, thankfully, I was proven wrong. But uh, we seem to comp comp <laughs> just uh, tr – just – Rebounded from that. Yeah, so, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off. No, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really interesting because this week there was this big article about Ga Gabrielle Union, who I love so much, this um, black actress. And there, right now there's a lot of um, sexual harassment going on it's, that's being exposed. The, all of these women that have been sexually harassed and how they've been oppressed. And Gabrielle Union's like, wait a minute, this is happening to black women too, but no one's talking about how the black women are being violated. And she even said like, white women have an obligation when you have the mic, hand the mic over. And it really resonated with me because as a woman, like I do know women are still oppressed more. Um, because yeah, Obama was elected president and I, I voted for him. I thought he was great. But at that time, back in 2008, I was like, oh, I knew he would win because nobody wanted a female president. Like, he, right? Like, mm. for the pre candidacy. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, people don't like Clinton. So I don't, I don't want to overgeneralize there. I mean, there's a lot there's going on. There's a lot on. of hatred towards her, though. Yeah. Look. Yeah. But there was, but as a woman, it was like, okay, a woman will never have the White House. And, Women, there's still a lot of oppression for women, um, but even more so for minority women. And I think we as women forget that. And I just, her words, like when I was reading this, like really rang for me, like they're, like they're still fighting. The fight isn't over. Like we're all still fighting. Like you said, like things that like 
things are coming back up that should not be happening. And it, it's just so sad. And you see, like, it's such a good reminder of what's at risk and why we can't let that happen. Right. And I think um, this is actually a sad bookend uh, to the Obama presidency because this book starts with hope, right? Um, it starts with the inauguration of Obama. And now we here we are after uh, two of his terms and it feels like we've taken this big step back. Yeah, yeah. Like all this hope that was in January 20th, 2009 and uh, John Lewis expressing uh, to the two young boys the history to show how far we've come. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's amazing. But now, whatever, eight years later, it's... You know, it's all been it's been undone. Yeah. And then I wonder, too, like I started thinking because two years ago, I want to say maybe um, even when Obama was president still, there was the one percent, the ninety nine percent movement. Right. And it was never effective. And I I wonder that like I started I was looking at their tactics. and I was like, how come we as a people were so big and we have so many more resources now, like social media? We have so many connections. How come we can't all come together and make this change happen like the way that they and and maybe it is because it takes years yeah it's not just as simple as let's hashtag it (laughs) you know and let's get Mm -hmm. and and i I do wonder though it's like there's a lot at stake and how do we make that change happen well and and it could be argued in some ways that history is repeating itself when the black lives matter movement uh, started really gaining some traction there were some old school uh, civil rights leaders who um, were young in this time period, but who were telling the BLM people, you know, you know, you're being too loud, you're being too aggressive, That's right. uh, and basically doing what their elders had told them. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I'm not super well versed in all of that, so I can't say what the proper ta- tactic is. You know, uh, but obviously something needed to change, and what the tactic from before maybe is not the tactic we use these days, but it's funny to hear um, these once young people who were part of this revolution kind of tell the next generation, well, hold on a a minute. You're, you're making too much noise when that's exactly what their elders told them. Yeah. That's a very interesting take because you're right. One last thing I would like to say about this book is I would like, if you're a listener of this and you think the black life movement, black lives matter movement is, a terrorist organization or no, that's the thing. That's the thing. They, they, they I just are, like bolted up in my seat. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Francis was, was like, what like, the who fuck thinks that nobody they, thinks they that there are people out there that consider it. They, they try to categorize it, categorize it as a terrorist movement. Or you think Colin Kaepernick and other NFL players are wrong for d- kneeling during, um, uh, the national anthem or black people are going about, trying if they if you think they're wrong or they have nothing there's no validity to their argument to say hey listen that happened a long time ago yeah i I would tell it i would encourage or if you have family members that share that opinion i would strongly encourage you to pick up these books march one uh march book one two and three you can get them at the library dennis has his copy he got it from the library i bought mine um uh but check them out from the library and i would say have your family members or your friends or yourself read the book and put put the parallel together like say this is this was in the 60s why do these people feel that they need to do this today like why are they doing this today what am i missing why do they feel that um these protests need to happen because there's a reason why they there there's a there's someone doesn't if you're if your house is on fire you're gonna run down the street saying my house is on fucking fire I need help and that's what these people are doing their communities are being oppressed family family members their brothers their sisters are being killed for no reason uh, this type of segregation and, and racism still happens in large parts of our country so just read this book and try and put it into the modern times too i would say i would agree it's a good lesson for now and before you before you like condemn people for protesting against something read something like this and see how there could be their perspective yeah Mm -hmm. that's what i would say 
Or even if you think you know, like I thought I knew, I didn't know yeah. anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. And once again, it speaks to the power of the graphic novel and the medium yeah. and how it can convey uh, a few ideas better sometimes than words mm-hmm. or it can help people digest things that maybe they even know, think they know about it. Yeah. No, it's it's a powerful book. I think it should be uh, something that's taught in schools. I think Absolutely. it should be mandatory reading with Tell of Two Cities and Mark no, Twain books. Tell of Two Cities is not should not be mandatory. That's <laughs> it's mandatory though. Should, they make you read that be, shit. I know. Yeah. I'm just saying, but this okay. should be. No. Uh, I just want to say thank you guys for reading this with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Like I, I was hesitant. I really didn't want to. Um, I kind of. Hawed and hemmed a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and I, I honestly thought it was going to be a snore fest. I thought it was yeah, just going like to be a history book. 123 Not pages. I was like, oh, okay, let me just, just history. through this. Yeah. But it, it was a very compelling uh, story, you know, a tale, uh, real life. And, um, yeah, I've, I've already checked out, like Johnny said, I checked out the first book from the library. Second volume and third volume are available at your local library, so don't uh, – let uh, perhaps a lack of funds stop you. You can uh, get it for free. All right. Where can people find you? Uh, they can find me, Johnny, on Twitter at Serious Top Twit, and I don't know my Instagram. <laughs> what about you, Francis Preziosi? You can find me on Insta at Words in Waffles, not Words and Waffles. Mm, like Captain Crunch? Yep. <laughs> uh, the podcast's uh, Twitter handle and Instagram is at GN Explorers Club, and you can email us, GN Explorers Club at gmail.com. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll Thank come you. back with something more cheerful. <laughs> there was hope in this book. No, hope. Well, not no more. <laughs> not, not, not now. Thank you for listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club. Next week, we will be back with Everything is Flammable by Gabriel Bell. Is that your air horn? Yeah. <laughs>